Well, now that I've told you all that and you have a lot of stress, <laughs> we're going to talk about stress. That's no fair. Well, here's the connection. Stress raises the body's stress hormones, but it also unbalances the whole hormone system in the body. And thus it starts to increase central obesity. By central, we mean amount around the middle. And it increases cardiovascular disease. Just this stress, psychological stress, and it increases diabetes quite dramatically. In fact, type A personalities have more diabetes than type B personalities. And so stress is a major factor. I've talked about how diabetes increases with weight gain. But why does diabetes increase with weight gain? You see, when the fat cells start to get fatter, they start deciding they're full and they don't want any more sugar. It's like you've made a big meal, you've eaten a big meal, you're all filled up and you go to visit your neighbor and when you go to visit your neighbor, they're making a big meal. And you walk in, they say, oh, so glad to see you. Please come in. I, we just made the best family dish we've ever made. It's just like my grandmother used to make. You've got to try some. Here. You're going, wait, wait, wait. I, I'm full. I didn't come over to eat. I, I, I'm sure it's good, but I don't want any. And they go, oh, come on. Just a little bit. Just, you know, just, I'm full. I'm sorry. And that's what the fat cells say. They say, I'm full. And this happens to fat cells, this happens to muscle cells, which accumulate fat as well. And pretty soon, the diabetic can't get any sugar into the cells. The pancreas starts making more and more insulin until the pancreas gives up. It burns out. It says, okay, I've had it. And it quits. And then you're in big trouble with a burned out pancreas. Let's look at this on a physiology chart for a minute. Here's a capillary. A capillary is the smallest blood vessel in the body, so small that only one red blood cell at a time can go through it. Every cell in your body sits on a capillary. For example, here's a normal cell. This normal cell will sit right here on the capillary where it can put its insulin receptors down in the bloodstream. Insulin can come along and bind to the receptor and the sugar moves into the cell. Well, let me just go over that again. You know, Insulin receptors are like doorknobs. Insulin is like the doorkeeper. When there's a doorknob, insulin can grab the doorknob. When it grabs the doorknob and opens the door, sugar can go through the door and go into the cell. Well, you notice I didn't put all the receptors down in the bloodstream where they could be attacked or, or opened by the insulin. And that's the way the cell regulates how much sugar it gets. If it wants more sugar, it puts more insulin receptors into the bloodstream. If it wants less sugar, it pulls them back in. For example, here's a very overfed fat cell. Notice that all the insulin receptors have been pulled up inside the cell where they won't be reached by any insulin. The door has no doorknob. We can't open it. So the insulin accumulates in the bloodstream and the sugar accumulates in the bloodstream and you have high blood sugar and high blood insulin. On the other hand, we have a diabetic, let's say, who has this problem and they start exercising. They start moving. They start, well, when they start exercising, the cell gets hungry. It puts all its receptors down into the bloodstream. Insulin can come and bind to the receptors and the sugar moves in to the cell. What did I say made the cell hungry? Exercise, that's right. Now let's look at glycemic index. This is an important concept for diabetics to understand. Glycemic means sugar, index means comparison. Glycemic index goes like this. Sugar has a glycemic index of 100, meaning it's 100% like sugar. Well, it really means that the blood sugar goes up 100% as fast as pure sugar would make it go up. So sugar is like sugar. Cornflakes and milk have a glycemic index of 93, meaning that when you eat cornflakes and milk, the blood sugar goes up 93% as fast as pure sugar. High glycemic index foods raise blood insulin and sugar levels very high. So they took a bunch of rats. Does that look like a skinny rat? It's like a pretty fat rat, huh? They took a bunch of rats and they fed them a high glycemic index diet, foods that would make their blood sugar go high fast. Within 32 weeks, these rats developed marked obesity. You ever seen a fat rat running around out in the neighborhood, out in the countryside? 
No, you don't see fat rats in nature. If there is one, the eagle sees him first, right? Uh -huh. Gets him. That's right. And when they fed people a high glycemic index meal, they ended up eating a larger volume of food. In fact, if you eat high glycemic meals, your stomach volume will actually expand. Your stomach gets bigger. And they felt less satisfied. Well, that's a scam. More food and less satisfied. What's more, they got hungry sooner and went and got some more of that food sooner. Ooh, that sounds like an addiction. It is. Now, there's another concept that goes with glycemic index, and that is glycemic load. By load, we mean how much of it you took. Small load versus large load. High glycemic load foods include things like, well, what's this? Corn chips. Cheese nachos. Well, why are corn, aren't they whole grain? Corn chips. You know, I have a video at home on how, to, how they make corn chips. They take and grind up the corn, make it into cornmeal, put it in big vats, and boil it, and boil it, and boil it for more than 24 hours. The longer you cook a food, the higher its glycemic index becomes. And so it's very high glycemic index food. Now, why do we have a hamburger and hot dog here? I thought those were like protein, not high glycemic. Well, if you look here, there's a white bun, and there's white potatoes, highly cooked, and so you do have a lot of carbohydrate there, and it's very refined carbohydrate, and so it is a very high glycemic load meal. And we have our colas and our pop, soda, cookies, sweet rolls, white flour, white pasta, white potatoes, and the more you cook white potatoes, the higher the glycemic index. White bread and white rice. On the other hand, in contrast, we have the low glycemic index foods. And these include things like tofu and olives and vegetables, avocados, sprouts, nuts, peas. Here we have beans and fruit and, and brown rice and bread and oatmeal. I thought diabetics couldn't eat fruit. Well, fruit, if eaten fresh, whole, without being processed, has lots of vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals that are very helpful, plus it has a lot of fiber. And the fiber slows the rate at which sugar enters the system. Now, I'm not suggesting that diabetics become fruititarians, <laughs> but on the other hand, fruit isn't something you necessarily have to avoid. In fact, it's an important part of a healthy diet. What are the consequences of high blood sugar? Well, if your blood sugar goes up, your triglycerides go up. Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. I thought triglycerides were like fat. And sugar is like carbohydrate. How come carbohydrate makes my fats go up? Well, your body, believe it or not, does not have a little box anywhere to store sugar cubes. It has no way of storing sugar. And so in order to store the sugar, it needs to make it into a form that is storable. And so it makes it into fats, triglycerides. Proteins are glycated. Oh, well, what's that mean? Glycated means sugar-coated. Oh, sugar-coated. Well, <laughs> that's not necessarily good when it's your blood cells and your blood vessels and your nerves and your tendons and so forth. You don't want to be sugar-coated. And then high blood sugar is chased by high insulin levels. The insulin goes up. Well, believe it or not, insulin is not just for putting sugar into cells. Insulin is also a growth factor. It makes things grow. It makes all kinds of things grow, but because it makes things grow, it needs building blocks, building blocks to build things. And one of those building blocks for cell walls is cholesterol. So high insulin makes high cholesterol. And then it also raises the blood pressure so everybody will get to work. And then it will make tumors start growing as well. Breast tissue that's tumorous, breast tumors, have about twice the number of insulin receptors as regular breast tissue. This is dangerous. And then it also increases central obesity. Obesity around your middle with more organ fat, visceral fat. Another problem with eating too much sugar is its effect on your white blood cells. Number of bacteria eaten by white blood cells in 12 hours. Notice if you're eating no sugar, then, and you're drinking just water, 
then each white cell can eat 14 bacteria. On the other hand, if you're drinking one soda, which has 12 teaspoons of sugar, each white cell can only eat 5.5 bacteria. If you're eating 24 teaspoons, two sodas, then each white cell can only eat one bacteria. And most Americans are eating about 52 teaspoons of sugar every day. And since none of you are eating that much, we know somebody else is eating way more than their share. But let's look at oranges versus orange juice for a minute. Notice that here I have time across the bottom. Up here I have blood sugar. If you drink orange juice, we're talking commercial orange juice. You buy it in the store. Orange juice that has been pasteurized. Well, what's pasteurized mean? They've heated it up. They're killing bacteria so that you can enjoy it longer. When they pasteurize it, heat it up, it breaks down complex sugars and starches into simple sugars and starches. And when it does that, it makes it a much higher glycemic index food. It makes it very little different from pop, actually, in its effect on your body. And so when you drink that orange juice, your blood sugar goes up way high, way up here. And then it doesn't stay up long. It comes crashing down to the ground. Oh, I'm feeling so faint. I better have another orange juice. And so people drink another orange juice, get another spike of blood sugar, and then another fall into the basement. On the other hand, when they eat an orange instead of the orange juice, you can see that the blood sugar comes up more slowly and it stays up a lot longer. And then it does not come crashing down like it did when you drank the juice. That's a big difference. That's a major difference. Let's look at this over a whole day. Similar graph, concentration of blood glucose over here. Over here is time. This is our danger zone. You don't want to go too low on your blood sugar. You'll pass out. I could have put a danger zone up here as well because you don't want to go too high either. But notice the insulin is in red, the glucose is in green. Let's start out the morning with a refined cereal breakfast like that, those cornflakes and milk I talked about earlier with a glycemic index of 93. Cornflakes and milk, up goes the sugar just like that and then down it goes into the basement because the insulin came shooting up because it thought there was an emergency. All that sugar pumping into the system in a hurry. Up goes the insulin and down goes the sugar. Oh man, I'm so faint this morning. Boy, is it about break time. I wish we could take a break now. What time is it? Oh, 10 o'clock. Okay, good. What's for, what, what can we have for break? Coffee and donuts. All right, up goes the sugar. Way high. Up goes the insulin. Down goes the sugar. Way into the danger zone. Oh, I'm really feeling tired and faint now. It must be about lunch time. What's for lunch? Oh, high protein lunch, but it's like a hot dog and a bun, and the bun is just refined carbohydrates, so the sugar doesn't go up so high, but the insulin comes up and down goes the sugar because it's not very well sustained. You can chase this thing all day long, and well, most people do. So what do they tell diabetics? Just eat many little meals all day day long and pretty soon all these peaks will start to coalesce because it's just going to be a sawtooth of all these little meals. Well, does that work? Well, it sort of works because yes, you do get all the peaks to sit together, but there's something you need to understand about your stomach. Your stomach is very similar to a washing machine. A washing machine? Yes. How so? Well, when you go and put clothes into a washing machine, Thump. Shut the lid. Thump. Oh, forgot the soap. Thump. Thump. Turn the dial. Push it. It starts to fill with water. You're happy it's going to be done in about an hour. And so you head up. Home comes Junior. Home from football practice. He's got to have his jersey tomorrow. He takes all his clothes off. He comes to the washing machine. He throws his dirty clothes in there. And it's in the rinse cycle. Oh, no, Junior, you can't do that. Start over again. Open the lid, thunk. Put in some soap. Close the lid, thunk. Start all over again. Don't you ever do that again, Junior. You gotta wait till it's through. And that is exactly what your stomach does every time you add more food to it before it was through with its cycle. They've done numerous studies on pills. They want to see how long it takes the pill to get out of the stomach. 
And in these studies, they'll give a person a few pills before breakfast. If the person eats breakfast, eats a mid-morning snack, eats lunch, eats a mid-afternoon snack, and eats supper, and then they look in the stomach, there will still be pills there from breakfast and some breakfast because they've just been jamming the machinery all day long. What's more, if you eat three meals a day instead of two, your risk of cancer goes up by 70%. If you eat four meals a day instead of three, it goes up by 90%. And each additional snack time during the day raises the risk of colon cancer another 60%. So that's a very dangerous way to fix diabetes. On the other hand, we're going to change the scenario. We're going to start the day off with a whole grain, unrefined breakfast. Oh, like that oatmeal that we showed in that chart earlier. Oatmeal. And so we start off the day. The scenario has changed. Now, just like the orange instead of the orange juice, the blood sugar comes up slowly. And then it goes down slowly. The insulin comes up slowly. And then it goes down slowly. But we know somewhere in here we're going to eat lunch. And so we have a fresh vegetable lunch. And up goes the sugar slowly. And up goes the insulin slowly. And down comes the sugar slowly. That is the cure, one of the parts of the cure for diabetes, changing the type of food we eat and how often we eat. Do you know that sugar clogs the system, but sugar is what the cells like to run on? Really? Yeah. Uh, that's their favorite food. Then why is it such a problem? If it goes too high, it tends to start sticking to things. For example, here's a blood vessel. I've chopped it on end so you can see down the inside of it. If you take that blood vessel and you add some sugar to it, I've made that blue for illustration, then the sugar starts to coat the inside of the blood vessel. As it coats the inside of the blood vessel, it gets thicker and thicker, more sugar and more coating until you have a thick wall of sugar. Well, that's no good. If I have a thick wall of sugar there, I'm going to be in trouble. You sure are. And here's a blood cell. And I'm looking down a blood vessel here. Notice that the sugar I've put in blue again is coating the outside of the cell. We call this hemoglobin A1C. This is a test we use in the hospital, hemoglobin A1C, to see how much sugar you have stuck to your proteins. Here's a high hemoglobin A1C. Lots of sugar stuck to the outside of the cell. Well, let's put the two together now. Here is the blood vessel with blood going down the middle and lots of sugar around the outside. Here's tissue on the outside like the diabetic's big toe. Well, you know, a lot of diabetics don't have big toes. I mean, they were born with them, but they got removed somewhere along the line. Well, we'll come back to that. Here is the blood vessel wall. Here's the sugar coating. Here is the hemoglobin A1C. We've got a problem. We can't get nutrition out here to the tissue. We can't get oxygen out here to the tissue. We can't get waste products from the tissue back into the bloodstream. And so we end up with a major problem. So the diabetic goes walking through the house. They step on a needle. They didn't know that Aunt Betty left there. The needle goes into the big toe all the way to the bone. Finally, they discover it and pull it out after the infection is starting all the way to the bone. But because they have this sugar coating inside the blood vessel and the sugar coating on the cells, they can't get white cells out there to clean up the infection. They can't get oxygen out there to help the body fight the infection. They end up with an infected toe that can't stop. And so we end up taking off those toes. Hemoglobin A1C is our way of measuring this problem. It predicts the risk of heart disease, death from heart attack, all kinds of mortality for people with or without diabetes. It indicates the average blood sugar over the last three months. And if it goes up to seven, we use that as another indication of diabetes. Well, some people have wondered how big a difference this makes. Well. If you have a 1% increase in hemoglobin A1C, glycated hemoglobin, then you have a 40% increase in mortality from heart disease. Your risk of dying goes up dramatically with an increase in this hemoglobin A1C. What about non-diabetics? Some of you are sitting here and saying, boy, I'm so glad I'm not a diabetic. Boy, I'm, I'm sure glad that 
the diabetics are listening to this because, but if you are eating like a diabetic, you could end up dying like a diabetic even though your blood sugars never go out of the range of normal. For example, here they did a study. They discovered that 70% of non-diabetics over the age of 45 have a hemoglobin A1C that's too high. It's over 5. Wow, that's no good. 70% of the population? That's a lot of people. And so they estimate that 80% of excess mortality due to blood sugar elevations is in non-diabetics. Wow, that's a bit scary. Hmm. On the other hand, there's some good news. For 1% reduction in hemoglobin A1C, you have a 17% reduction in risk of stroke, 18% reduction in risk of heart attack, 25% reduction in risk of diabetic deaths, and a 30% reduction in risk of retinopathy, that's the eyes, kidney disease, and amputations. So there is a benefit from lowering your hemoglobin A1C.